Hi guys, my name is Jim. I work here at the Wyoming State Museum. I'm one of the people who's responsible for the state's artifact collection. And the museum is closed today, and that's because the governor is trying to get a, a handle on the whole COVID-19 situation, so we might be closed for another week, we might be closed for a few weeks, it's really hard to say at this point in time. But museum staff is still coming in, practicing good social distancing, uh, to make sure that the artifacts are well taken care of. So, for instance, today I came into one of our storage areas uh, just to make sure that the uh, there's nothing wrong with the overhead pipes, that there are no leaks, uh, make sure that the HVAC system is still functioning as it should, and to make sure that the security system is still in place. But when I got down here, I thought I was thinking about the fact that nobody can come in to see museum exhibits and see museum artifacts. And so I thought, well, I, why, how about I take my phone and wander through the storage area and just video a couple of things, uh, give a little bit of a, of a background story for them. And in that, in that way, I can, even though people can't come down to actually see the artifacts themselves, it gives me the chance to take artifacts out for people to see. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, take a few minutes, sit back, and I'm going to go through the storage area and, and show you some interesting bits and pieces, give you a little bit of a story. And uh, I do apologize for what could be really bad audio and video. Uh, I'm just using my phone here, so if you have to turn the audio up and turn it back down because I'm moving the, the camera back and forth closer to my face, uh, you know, I apologize for that. But uh, it's the only equipment I have at the moment, so hopefully it'll, it'll be good enough. Anyway, let's go take a look at some cool stuff here in the Wyoming State Museum storage space. So I give tours of the of our storage space here at the, at the Wyoming State Museum from time to time. Well, there's one thing that I always point out every time I come in, so if you've, if you've been on one of my tours and this is redundant to you, I apologize. But it's one of the more interesting things uh, that I think we have in the collection. And it's right over here in our, in our firearms rack. I am going to one-handedly put on some, some uh, white cotton gloves just to make sure that I don't pass any oils and salts from my fingers onto the piece that I'm about to touch. The item we're looking at is this wooden rifle right here. I, I use the term rifle loosely. It looks like more of a toy. But I'm going to take it and put it on a cart so that I can talk about it without dropping it on the floor. And I'm going to go back over here and get a photograph that we keep very close to this piece. So, this is our first piece. Do kind of a slow pan here. You can see that it is in the rough shape and length of a rifle. Looks like something that I would have put some clothes pins on, cut a notch here at the end of it so that I could have used it as a rubber band gun when I was a kid. But, interesting thing, if you look at this photograph, This woman right here, number seven, her name is Mabel Tupper. And Mabel is holding a rifle, you can see it right there, and that is this rifle that we have in front of us. So the story behind this is that in the late 1880s, about 1889, it might have started as early as 1888, but I want to say that it was 1889, Mabel Tupper and a number of other teenage girls from Southeast Wyoming took to studying the manual at arms for the United States military. And they received assistance in this from some of the officers out at um, Fort D.A. Russell here in Cheyenne. The goal of them learning the manual at arms was so that they could perform as an honor guard during Wyoming statehood celebrations in July of 1890. So, the girls practiced really hard at this. This was not something that they did just on the occasional weekend. In fact, they reached a stage where, of perfection in this uh, where they were being com uh, compared to West Point cadets. They were so precise in, in their marching and in their uh, maneuvering uh, about turns, things like that. I mean, they, they really put an awful lot of effort into this and became quite skilled uh, at the manual at arms. So again, the goal, to the goal for this was to perform at the state of the celebrations and what they did on that day was they acted as an escort, an honor guard escort for a float 
that had um, a representative or a girl who represented each of the other states in the Union at the time Wyoming entered the Union. And so they marched beside it uh, as the parade made its way through downtown Cheyenne up to the Wyoming State Capitol. And so you can see the girls are standing here. This was taken either after the parade or possibly just before it. I don't really know. But you can see back here in the background, this is the fairly recently constructed uh, front steps of the Wyoming State Capitol here behind them. And then if you look, the girls have individual uniforms that mimic military uniforms of the 1800s. Anyway, there were two um, of these Girl Guard units. One was Company H, one was Company K, and both sets of, girl, of girls, uh, again, they trained very, very hard with this. And they also did public performances at a variety of different locations. They did a lot of them here in town, but they also did some at uh, state fairs, county fairs, and things like that. The whole project only lasted for about a year and a half, I want to say, possibly two years. And there were some other Girl Guard units around the nation who did uh, similar things at the time. But um, from, every, of course, all the biased Wyoming newspapers said that the Wyoming Girl Guards were the absolute best ones. If you are interested in some more history about the Girl Guards, there is a book that came out in 2019, published by a local historian here in Cheyenne called Dan, his name is Dan Lyon. And it's called um, Girl Guards of Wyoming, The Lost Women's Militia. And it covers the history of the Girl Guards um, activities and their training. And it also has an interesting uh, biography at the end of it that covers the history of as many of the girls as he could, he could find information on. It's available on Amazon. You can also get it in the, in the Wyoming State Museum bookstore. But, um, and I'll do a little bit of self-serving showing of pride in, in uh, family history. You've got Mabel Tupper here. She's number seven. She's, that's the one whose rifle we're, we've been looking at. Number eight here, that's a young lady by the name of Lavinia Granger. And Lavinia Granger was my great, great aunt. So that could be the reason why I spend so much time talking about this rifle whenever someone comes in for a tour of the, of the storage area here at the Wyoming State Museum. So we're gonna move on here and take a look at some other things. Um, this is something that will give you nightmares uh, if you come in here when the lights are low. It's a piece of artwork. I can't remember the artist's name, but it's supposed to represent um, the plight of the elderly who are locked away behind closed doors and things. But it's, a, it's kind of a haunting piece, and I think that was the artist's intent. But where I'm headed is over here to this cabinet. Let me get this open. And what I want to show you in here is a hat. And I think it's in shelf number four. Yes, there it is. So, this is a hat that would have been at the height of fashion in about 1900, 1902. Um, and that is indeed a dead bird on top of the hat. I think it's a flicker that is uh, encased in this net on top of the hat. Back in the late 1800s, the reason I'm pointing this out is because hats of this type, and there were tens of thousands of them made, hats of this type had a real impact on the conservation movement across the nation in the early 1900s. This particular piece is of a whole bird, uh, or has, a, has an entire bird on it, but there were a lot of pieces, a uh, lot of hats that had only different bird parts on them. So um, feathers, sometimes they had beaks, sometimes they had talons. But this is a, as I said, this is a major um, component of style on the upper middle class and the upper classes back from, say, 1885 all the way up into the early 1900s. The problem was it was such a popular style that it led to the uh, decimation of a lot of bird populations across the United States and, and around the world. There was a, there's a record of a London feather merchant who put in one order for um, heron feathers. And the 
heron feathers, there were only a couple of feathers on each heron that would allow, that were the type that were wanted for a particular, um, uh, it was a tiara that was worn by women of the higher classes to social soirees and, and various parties. But there were only a couple of feathers on these herons that they wanted for these tiaras. And the feather merchant from London, in one order, it is estimated that it would have required uh, the killing of about 150,000 herons just for this one order that this gentleman made. Uh, it's also estimated that in 1902, uh, I believe it was, the state of Florida ended up killing, not the state of Florida itself, but people in the state of Florida, uh, feather hunters, killed over five million birds in one year uh, in pursuit of, of feathers. It was a very lucrative business, and so uh, it's not surprising that a lot of people took it up and, and went out to try and, and supply the demand for, for these, um, these bits and pieces that ended up on, on women's uh, headpieces. Anyway, uh, after a few years of this, or after several years of this, people started to notice a definite decline in the bird populations, in various bird populations. And so organizations like the Audubon Society also helped to bring this to people's attention. And then it was kind of a middle class uprising, a middle class women upri women's uprising, where they started to put pressure on politicians to curtail this, uh, to get it under control. And so it led to a lot of states passing legislation that outlawed uh, the harvesting of birds for fashion outright. Uh, but eventually the, the process continued, the political process continued to the point where in 1918 the Mad M Migratory Bird Act was passed, which eliminated people being able to go out and harvest birds like this for commercial purposes. So, a uh, hat like this, we do have a little bit of information on who owned it, but to me the most interesting thing is that it's a representation of a particular style of, um, of dress that led to a series of laws that affected the nation as a whole. So yeah, I, it's, uh, it's a bit of a disturbing piece in some ways. I mean, I, it's a, I don't know about wearing a dead bird that's probably slathered in arsenic to preserve it. I don't know about wearing that on my head, but uh, you know, fashions change, I guess. Anyway, bird hat that led to some interesting legislative changes and some interesting cultural changes in the United States. Uh, the results of those, that legislation definitely saved some bird species from extinction. Oh, what else we got here? Okay, we have, I'm gonna go back and grab my cart real quick that I put our firearm on. We have an exhibit coming up fairly soon. It's called Ghosts of War. That should be open in the next next couple of weeks. Hopefully, it won't be too long before people can come down and, and have a look at it for themselves. But I'll show you a couple of the pieces that are going to be in that exhibit. They haven't been placed in their cases just yet. So the first piece I'm going to show you is this one. Let's set it right here. So this is a piece from World War I. This is a modified French 75 millimeter artillery shell casing. And if you turn, if I turn it here, you can see that this shell casing has been turned into a vase. Now back in World War I, the soldiers that were in the trenches, both on the German side and the Allied side, they, they, had a, they actually had a lot of time on their hands, uh, knee deep in mud. There was, there was a, a fair amount of time spent between going up over the top. And to, you know, to try and assuage that boredom, what they did was they, they took to creating artwork. A lot of them took to making artwork out of whatever they had at hand. So some of the Allied soldiers were taking these artillery shell casings and they were turning them into various pieces of art. They would carve their names into them or hammer their names into them. They would hammer the names of their units into them, things like that. But the French peasantry in the area uh, soon realized that there was a, an actual market for this kind of thing as souvenirs for some of the Allied soldiers. And so they took to a kind of an industrialized process of cranking out what had previously been made by hand by the American and, and British and, and other Allied soldiers. Now it was illegal for the French peasants to take this, these brass casings because they were actually, they could actually be reloaded. But they did it anyway because there must have been enough profit in it to make them risk breaking the law. 
But the way that you can tell these, the ones that were made by the, the um, local French farmers and French peasants was they had some really major uh, alterations to the, to the shell casings. Uh, There's nobody sitting in a trench in two feet of mud who was going to be able to put these scallops into the side of this artillery casing. Uh, so this was done through some sort of a press. Uh, they would just run it through and then it would just grind the thing, or uh, uh, compress the thing down to where they had this nice border here, the, to this nice scallop section here. And then they would fill the rest of it with sand and then they would just use a hammer and a, a chisel or a pick of some sort to hammer away at it until they ended up with the design that they wanted. So if you go to flea markets, these things can actually be found pretty regularly. There was quite a, quite a few of these were brought back by the American Doughboys in World War I. Um, if you find these, if you find something like this, if it has these really heavy edges put into it, things that probably weren't made, you probably couldn't have done with a hammer and, and uh, some sort of a blunt nail, uh, chances are it was actually made by a French peasant rather than uh, an Allied soldier. So, but it's an interesting piece to me because it proves that even in a situation that was as horrific as World War One, uh, people were still trying to find a way to make a buck, uh, in the, or in this case, make a franc. Uh, so, and these people who obtained these shells couldn't have been that far from the front, but they still found a way to make a profit out of, the, out of the situation that they found themselves in. Interesting piece. Let's see. Okay, the next piece that I will show you is this one. This is a really neat piece. If you look at the front of it here, it says souvenir. If you look at the back of it, it says Wyoming 1945. On the top of it, it has a scene of, there's like a night scene here with a river going by, and then there's the moon up there in the background surrounded by a lot of trees. And then inside the box, there's another scene of a road and what looks like either a village or possibly some houses or something uh, tucked away in the trees there. Anyway, this particular piece came to us from a man by the name of Merle Hansen. And Merle Hansen was a, sorry, I think I probably just cut out the, the audio there. Merle Hansen, this came to us from a man by the name of Merle Hansen. And Hansen was a guard at a prisoner of war camp here in Wyoming back in 1944-1945. He was guard at Ryan Park prisoner of war camp, and any of you who have been camping in southern Wyoming uh, at any time uh, over in the Snowy Range area near Saratoga, you've probably stayed or at least driven past Ryan Park Campground. Well, Ryan Park Campground was once Ryan Park POW Camp. And if you go to the, I believe it's the west end of the camp, you can find some interpretive signs that tell you where the various buildings of the camp were. And I think there's even a map there that shows kind of how the camp was laid out. Anyway, Merle Hansen was one of the guards, and he also took the prisoners up to, do, to work in timber operations because most of the able-bodied American boys who were off fighting World War II, uh, somebody had to kind of fill their shoes in order to keep some of these industries going. So Merle Hansen was one of the ones who would load the prisoners up in a truck and take them up to where they would work with saws and whatever all day to uh, take down timber and then get it down to, um, get it down to market. Merle, had, there was a really interesting oral history that was done with Merle Hansen where he talked about the different types of prisoners that came to be in the camp. Uh, he said that there were Austrian, German, and Italian prisoners of war. And he said that the Italians were the ones that were the easiest to work with. They were, usually they were highly educated. They were doctors and lawyers and dentists and such. And they really didn't want to be in the war. They were happy to be out of it. And they spent most of their time uh, singing and dancing and. Uh, constructing things, little bits of artwork. They like to make toys. And the, the guards got along really well with the Italians to the point where the guards at one point took up a collection of money and bought the Italian prisoners some musical instruments so that they could uh, have a little band. And then the Italian prisoners would give concerts for the guards and the guards' families uh, on Sundays. And I, I think, I, I would have to believe that one of the reasons why uh, this was given to Merle Hansen, this was made by one of the Italian prisoners, one of the reasons that this was made for Merle Hansen was as a way of saying thank you for 
uh, the way that the Italians were treated by the guards during their stay there. It could be, I've always thought that possibly, there's no way to know for sure, but I've always wondered and thought that possibly this scene on the inside could be a view down the road toward Ryan Park uh, prisoner of war camp, but it's something we'll never know for sure. Anyway, a really neat piece made by an Italian prisoner of war in 1945 as a gift for his guard at Ryan Park POW camp. Uh, moving on. Okay, here, this is something that everybody who comes into this storage area, they, they have questions about this particular piece. So let's talk about it for a couple of seconds. I'm going to walk kind of slowly down here to give you, I hope, some idea of just how big this piece is, how big this firearm is. And if you look, I don't have a tape measure and I don't really want to go and get one and waste more of your time. So I'm going to just give you some idea of how big it is by pacing it off. So there's my foot next to the butt of the gun. So it's about three paces. My pace is about three feet, something like that. So this, is, this gun is about nine feet long. It's what's known as a punt gun. And it has a, the diameter of its barrel is one inch, which means, and those of you who know that, know how to figure out that formula for uh, converting bore diameter to gauge, correct me if I'm wrong, but I want to say that that means that this is a one gauge, one gauge uh, gun. Punt guns were used in a lot of places around the world and what you did with it is it was the, the term punt gun comes from the fact that it was that these types of guns, these enormous, long, large bore guns, were mounted on the front of um, punts or a punt is a flat bottomed boat or a very shallow draft boat usable in, in really, really shallow water. So what you would do is you, if you had your punt gun, you, it's a black powder weapon, and you would load it with shot, and then you would take it and mount it onto your punt. And then, very stealthily, you would lay down in your punt, and you would, by using just your arms to propel you through the water, you would try and sneak up on um, waterfowl, so ducks or geese or something like that. And when you got to within 10 or 15 yards, you'd cut loose with this thing, and the stories that I've read say that people generally kill, if they, if they had a, a, a flock of geese or ducks that, were, that was of sufficient size, they could end up killing between 30 and 50 uh, waterfowl within one shot, with one shot. In fact, there's a, there's a story from a gentleman who went out with a couple of his friends, and they would, all three of them would end up uh, going up with their own punt guns to a flock of birds, and they get in kind of a one-third circle ring on one side of the flock and then shoot at them. Well, the, the best total that they had, according to this, this one gentleman who was relaying the story, was killing over a thousand ducks in one evening with just six shots. Uh, and there's, there was a lot of money to be made by this. There were restaurants and things like that that were um, more than happy to take the, the ducks off of the hunter's hands. And so this was something that was, was um, very lucrative for people to be for people to get into but again as with the hat uh, it led to a lot of overhunting and a lot of actual hunters started to complain that there were fewer and fewer ducks and, and wildfowl to be able to go out and find when it was when, it, when they went out went out to go hunting and so this also use of the punt gun also led to regulations such as uh, specific hunting seasons uh, limits on the number of of animals that you could take with uh, your license and things like that so the punt gun is, is essentially no more, but this, it's got an interesting history uh, as far as I'm concerned. Now this particular gun we really don't know an awful lot about. There's, I'll just point out one interesting bit on here. If you look, you can see some Japanese characters right on the top of this particular punt gun. I hope you can see that. Anyway, uh, the information associated with this particular gun seems to have been missing. It hasn't been around for a long, long time. 
So I'm trying to piece back together the story of this particular piece. And as near as I can tell, this may have belonged to John J. Pershing, General John J. Pershing. Pershing was, he had a, a tie to, to Wyoming in that he was married to Governor Francis E. Warren's daughter. And we have a number of items that belong to Pershing here in our collection. And uh, all of the things that we do have seem to be tied into his stay in Japan as a military attache in the early 1900s. And so I've got a feeling that this may be a souvenir that he brought back with him from Japan during his time as military attache. And it just ended up here at the Wyoming State Museum. But I haven't quite proven that yet. That's just the theory that I'm working off of. Anyway, another, to me, very, very interesting piece. So uh, it looks like I've been talking to you for almost a half an hour. I'm going to take a look at one more thing, or maybe two more things, and then we'll call it a day. This is a neat item here. I haven't laid eyes on this for quite some time. It's, uh, I think it's, this just came off of exhibit. It says that it's a picnic case picnic case from the 1960s. I want to say it's maybe 50s, but let's take a look inside and see what we have. Oh yeah. Yeah, really neat. Um, I'd say 1950s, maybe early 1960s. We, I don't know anything about it, to be honest with you. I'd have to go check the files to see what its history is, but which is something I'm not going to do right now. But what a neat piece. Oh, yeah, you've got your, your bread. Our sandwich container here to put things in. It's got a little vent hole there in the side. How cool is this? Anyway, yeah, that, that stopped. That, that, looking at that was for me. So, And if you really needed to, you could lock this, this case up so nobody could steal your sandwiches or your potato chips or whatever. Anyway, uh, last thing that I'm going to show you is this Buck Rogers looking thing here, which is pretty cool too. This dates to the 1940s or 1950s. This is a saccharimeter, and it's a device that was used to measure sugar. So here in Wyoming, there's a, a major cash crop is um, sugar beets. A lot of sugar beets are grown here in southeast Wyoming, where I am, but uh, sugar beets are also grown up in north, central, and a little bit westish Wyoming. So one of the things, and this is, I've got a feeling that this, yes, this originally belonged to the Holly Sugar Corporation. So what this saccharimeter does is it measures the sugar content of your sugar beets. And this was, it was done with this little device long before everything was kind of, ruined by the use of computers. Uh, let's see, it looks like the optics were manufactured by Bausch & Loam. They make contact lenses and things like that to this day. And it also has, ooh, it's got a gelat polarizer. And if anybody can tell me what a gelat polarizer is, I would love to know what that is. I've got a feeling it has something to do with the prisms that are used to make this, this device work. Anyway, how it, how, what I know of, it's of the way that it functions is you have a light bulb in this end. And then what you would do is you would open this little trap door here. And then you would take, what you would do is you would take the crop that you wanted to have a look at and you would, you would boil some of the beets in order to get a sugary water solution. And there's a special way that you did that. I, I, to be honest, I don't know what it was. But I'm sure it had to be something that was consistent so that you had a consistent measurement of the sugar content every time you did this. But then you would take this, and these ends come off of this. And you can see that there's glass here at the ends. You would take this, take the end off, one of the ends off this, and you would fill it with that sugar solution. And then you would look through this prism down here at this end and the light from the light bulb down here would go through the tube filled with the sugar water and then you would be able to measure the light's reflection off of the sugar crystals that were in the, um, sugar, in the sugar solution that you would boil off of the sugar beets. 
And that would give you an idea of how much the sugar content was of the crop that you were getting ready to harvest or that you had just harvested. I want to say that the sugar beet, sugar beet, sugar concentration in, here in Wyoming runs about 16%, 15%, something like that. But I'm sure that you, as a, as a manufacturer of processed sugar, you needed to know exactly what the sugar content was of the beets that you were working with so that you had a consistent product when you, when you took that sugar to market. Anyway, an interesting thing from the 1940s, 1950s, of course they don't use this anymore, like I said, it's all done by computer, but a really neat, I'm sure at the time, high-tech piece to help sugar manufacturers in Wyoming get their products to market. So that's coming up on 29 minutes. I hope that you found this interesting. Um, if you have any questions about this, feel free to drop an email to me or you can respond to, I'll have this both on YouTube and on our, well, embedded in our Facebook page. If you have any questions, feel free to email me or contact me in whatever way you choose or you can make a comment directly on the, on the YouTube page or the Facebook page. And hopefully, let me turn this around so I'm looking at you. Uh, hopefully I'll, you have some time to do some of these again sometime have some time to do these again sometime that's great i'll do one of these again at some point in the future if there's an interest uh, but until then i hope that you found this as interest and then, uh, i hope that in some small way i've helped you to uh, get through this whole covid 19 situation uh, so until the next time i i present one of these or the next time you stop in the museum be safe and thanks for staying with me for the past half hour have a good night